Pastor JT, Pastor Jack's over there trying to get things set up on the little GoPro. Uh, so anyhow, we have a couple announcements today. Uh, again, we still need food for the box outside. Um, if y'all can bring some food in, that would be incredible. There's lots of people that still come in and use it. And um, all, most of the churches, I think everybody that's started in the beginning of COVID is still doing it. Uh, so it's still meeting that need for the community, which is awesome. Uh, the, the other announcement that we have is uh, we still have the February 12th is going to be the chili. Uh, you come and pick it up or we bring it to you if you order more than five orders. And that's only during the lunch time we'll bring it to you. In the dinner time, you still got to come get it. So get with Jack or myself or uh, actually, yeah, Jack or me and we'll get you some tickets. And they're $10 a piece per serving and you get... Chili uh, with beans, or chili with no beans, or chili with beans and rice, or chili with just rice. It's all kinds of cool combos, and but you get the cheese and the onions if you want, and all that kind of extra stuff with it too, and some crackers. It's gonna be really good, and it's for a good cause and to, for here at the church and um, the ministries here at the church. Also, the scouts are still collecting food too, all, but they're gonna be giving that to us here at the church to meet that need with the the box out there. Uh, as people have been coming, and it's been empty a lot lately, so we really, really, that is a big need here. The last thing is, uh, I don't remember, the, it's the next Tuesday, Jack? The Sunday. Ne when? Next Sunday? Oh, that's right, yeah. So next Sunday is our uh, church in two weeks. No. At two o'clock. Oh, at two o'clock, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I don't have it written down in front of me. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, the, so we're going to have a council meeting, or plan, is it the planning one, Jack? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're still planning, correct? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a council meeting so that we can finalize the plans yeah. for the chili dinner yes. and do the church business that but, we have to do. That's right. So 2 p.m. next Sunday. Be there, be square, or something like that. I don't know. Uh, I'm just kidding. All right. So thanks for being here. Let's do some worship. Time for the video.
wait just a minute. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to thank everybody for being here. And you, some of you are saying, well, there's not that many people. But there's a lot of people that will be watching us. And so I just wanted to say a couple of things about that. We are doing face-to-face -face worship. And you're invited to come if you feel safe and you want to be here. Uh, we have space and we can socially distance and so we're welcome to have you. But we're also grateful that you worship with us wherever you are. And so as we worship, we, we also do all the other stuff that goes along with church. And uh, we want you to be able to participate in that with us. One of the things we do, of course, is uh, we collect an offering. And if you're interested in helping support the ministries here, you can do that in a number of ways. Uh, if you log on to our website at hopecommunityumc.org, you'll find... Uh, a place where you can text to give and then you can also just page on down and find the, uh, the online giving page or you can do like a lot of people do and you can drop a check in the mail and bring it i just want to assure you that the ministries of our church go on even though the numbers are less uh, we're still proceeding to do stuff to help people we've been collecting money for the methodist children's home uh, we've done a number of things over the last year i don't expect things to change significantly in the next months uh, until everybody's been vaccinated or whatever needs to happen happen but we just want people to stay safe and healthy and well and if you're not feeling well then watch us online good pray all right now is our time for the people's prayer so let us go to god in prayer gracious lord we give you thanks for today and and every day that uh we we don't take well we pray that we don't take for granted that we cherish each moment that we get to spend with our loved ones and that we get to spend with you and in fellowship with you. And Lord, may, may our, our blessings multiply, and not just in our lives, but in the lives that, uh, that we're around, the lives that we get to impact and make a difference. We make that difference for, for you. It's how you're changing us to be more like you. And God, we just we lift up those in our community and those around us. And God, we just ask that you to just keep pouring into them and pour blessings into their lives. Go with us from this day and help us remember to just always wake up and smile and have joy and just keep praising you.
It is great to be here tonight. We, uh, Kathy and I have been gone all week. We had to come home to rest from our vacation. Uh, and that's literally true. We spread dirt, dug ditches, all that kind of fun stuff. Uh, the, uh, you know, when you get to go out around other places, the, the world is not the same world I used to live in. Uh, as they say in the alien movies, civilization as we know it has changed in so many ways. And uh, we've got a choice, I guess. We can be sad about it, or we can find ways to adapt. Uh, many, many years ago, I was a tractor salesman, and I sold a tractor to a guy down in Sabine Pass. And uh, it was a really, it was a customer's tractor, it was a consignment deal, and it was really a junkie tractor, but it was going to a fish factory where they processed fish, so you didn't want a new tractor there. And it uh, started raining, and so me and the guy that I was buying the tractor were sitting in the truck, you know, like guys always do. You ever notice guys always have a philosophy, you know, about life? We were talking about this and that. He said, look, he said, you can do all the idealistic things you want to do, but he said, my suggestion is you learn the rules and make it work for you. And so that's kind of where I see us today, is we learn what the rules are, and then let's don't give up and just go home and do nothing. Let's make it work for us. Um, I think sometimes when we read the scriptures, that's the message as well, is that uh, we don't live in the same times when they were written, and we don't understand them the same way that those reading them or hearing them in those days would have understood them, but it is a living text. And so there are things we can glean from it, I think, if we pay attention. Tonight I'm reading from 1 Corinthians in the 8th chapter. It's uh, the first 13 verses. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, for whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things, and through him, we exist. It's not everyone, however, who ever has, has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We're no worse off if we do not eat, no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and while wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is the cause of your failing, falling, I will never eat meat, so that I may not cause one of them to fall. You know, as I read that, I'm, I'm reflective of a couple of things. I, for those of you that don't know, I'm, my name's Jack. I'm a recovering alcoholic. And by the grace of God, I've been sober for a while. The, uh, one of the things about the, the church work uh, is in the United Methodist Church, of course, when we do communion, we use scriptures. Um, there is a story about that, probably some of it's legend, but there is some truth to it as well, as is often true of legends. Uh, back before, in, in the old days, before they knew how to pasteurize grape juice, uh, it would, they would, the priest or priest or preacher or whatever would put it out for communion, and before it would even get ready to have worship, it would ferment. And so Mr. Welch, from Welch's grape juice, figured out how to pasteurize grape juice so that we would be able to have non-alcoholic wine. Now this was really 
prior to and then during the prohibition time. But I've always appreciated that we understand that the new wine referred to in the Bible is pretty much what we drink as grape juice. It's really very, barely firm. That's why you don't put new wine in old wine skins because it has yet to ferment. It would blow them up. Uh, so one of the things that I've always appreciated as a recovering person is that we believe that the sacrament is the sacrament regardless of that. And that why would we be a stumbling block to that person that is working on recovery and would come in and feel like they needed to participate in the sacrament and it would be wine only. Now, because I'm also in the Order of St. Luke, which is a, a liturgical society, we, we, uh, when we have events, we usually have both. For those people that want to have wine for communion, we have that. I always get a kick out of that because as the recovering guy, they always have me serve the wine. I don't really understand that, but that's the way it works. Uh, but, but I think that uh, it's one of those things we do. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about our theological understanding as Wesleyans, as Methodists, um, in, in the sense of, of the Bible. Wesley gave us some things to remember or ways to study it or methods, if you will. That's how we got to be called Methodists. Uh, he was called a reasonable enthusiast. Neither one of those were good names in the old days. Uh, he was reasonable, that was bad, and he was an enthusiast, that was worse. Uh, he believed you needed to have some kind of a heartwarming experience with God. I believe that tr is true. But he gave us these fourfold things of scripture, tradition, reason, and experience. Well, at Wesley's time, everybody understood the primacy of scripture. And everybody understood that God gave us a mind, and so you get to think about it. And tradition has always played a heavy role in what we do in the church. It's a very strong part of what we do. Uh, you know, we, we do a lot of things here on Sunday in our traditional service because you always do them in a traditional service. And what Wesley added to that was experience. It happened for him on May the 24th on the day we celebrate his Alders Gay Day when he went to a meeting he didn't want to go to to be with some people he didn't care that much for, to hear something he already knew. And God moved anyway. And he felt his heart strangely warm. There's a movie about that, and when it gets to be May, we'll be glad to show the movie. movie. Uh, I've seen it a number of times. I always enjoy it. So the, the deal is that we don't ever want to be a stumbling block in someone's faith. It's one of the things I've always appreciated about the Methodist church I grew up in, is that we have people that come here that believe in only in believer's baptism. And that's okay. That's absolutely fine. I, I, as a Methodist preacher, get to also do infant baptisms. But some people don't believe in that. That's okay. And so what we do is we try not to be bound by the dogma or teachings of a particular group, and we try to look forward to what this scripture says, is that knowledge or those following the rules kind of things, they can puff you up pretty big. You can get to a place where you think, I got it right, and they don't. You can read the scripture in such a way that you believe only a certain group of people get to appreciate the scripture. And you forget to go back and read the, 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 the birth narratives in, in uh, both Matthew and in Luke, and you'll find that God sent Jesus to earth, Emmanuel, God with us for everybody. And so we, we have, a, we have a, a responsibility to not be uh, in a silo of just Methodists or a silo even of just Christians. Because the reality is those other people out there, they only know what they think they know. And until they're exposed to something different, something else, something more true, or something uh, with a wider perspective, they're going to be bound by their, their little things. My mother-in-law was a, a, a devout Baptist. Um, uh, she tolerated some of my theological stuff. And... Uh, and I remember when she told us, she said that the, uh, I'm not picking on the Baptists either. The Baptists are fine folk, but uh, we Methodists and Baptists usually have kind of a thing going. But uh, the, the ukulele band was coming to her church. And so the people were very excited about it. And before it started, the preacher stood up and he said, now you can tap your toe or you can tap your heel, but you can't move them both because people would see us as dancing. Okay, now, in, in my opinion, that's following the rules a little too close. If you haven't watched the movie Footloose lately, go watch it, because I think there's dancing and music all over the Bible. 
You know, but some people have decided. My mother grew up in Seacrest, Texas. She was in a very small town in a very staunch. Uh, there were a lot of Baptists. There were a lot of uh, Assembly of Gods. There were actually a lot of Methodists. She never told us that. And they had a beach for the girls to swim on and a beach for the boys to swim on. They could not go on the same beach at the same time. She had to go clear up to Port Lavaca to swim on a mixed beach beach and couldn't tell her mom about it. Now, I think when, when religion does that, when that knowledge, I think that's what Paul's talking about, that kind of knowledge that can buff you up where you think, I've got it, and if you do that, you don't. Does that make sense to anybody? Yes. And, and I think that so many times that's the way those outside the church see us. Mm -hmm. They drive by and they say, well, that's those self-righteous people that never made a mistake, that never did anything wrong, and they think they've got it better than us. They don't know how broken we are. That's right. They don't know how many sins we've already committed today and how many we may commit before the day's over and how the only difference in us and them is we know who can forgive them. Now, they're going to think there's other ways to be forgiven, sometimes by good actions, right? And that's what people, even Wesley believed that at some point early in his ministry, that if he fed enough sick people and took care of enough people that were in prison, God would bless him and let him get to heaven. That is so ridiculous. But it's so much a belief of so many people that there's something I can do. Friends, there is nothing you need to do except give your heart to Christ. That's right. Now, one of my motorcycle vests has a thing on it. It says, I'm an organ donor. I gave my heart to Jesus. Uh, you know, really, that's how simple it is. Now, be prepared. <laughs> because when you do that, your life is likely to change. Uh, you're very likely to start to see things you didn't see before. You're likely to have opinions that you didn't have before. You're likely to have beliefs that transcend the possibility of what you ever thought you could believe. Suddenly, you find yourself living in a world where you almost feel like an alien. And I think that's true of us. If we didn't feel different, we wouldn't be doing the work. But so many times we get caught up in, in doing what we need to do to keep the church happy. We were, we were just talking before we started today. Uh, our worship leader, Chris, has lots of church experience over the years. The church can, can bless you and lift you up, and the church can push you out if you're not careful. And the, the sad thing is, is that sometimes you don't even realize what you're doing to get put into one of those places. I remember after I went to one of my first AA meetings years and years ago, I told the pastor, I said, I don't understand why church can't be more like that. Why, why those people go in there, they're broken, and they know they're broken. Maybe that's part of the difference. And, and they're accepted anyway in whatever shape, form, or fashion they come. And so many times when somebody different comes into the church, maybe they're dressed different or they act different or, or maybe they, they come in with a, a, some kind of weird theology or something, we say, well, they just don't fit in. Well, let me tell you, we're not doing God's work when we do that, but we need to pay attention to this because when we become the people that think we have knowledge, we have missed the part about having a heart for God. Sometimes people need to put it in perspective for you. I remember going to a, to a meeting one time and the guy, when I walked in, the guy said, how was your day? And I said, it was kind of sucky. And he said, well, did you drink today? I said, no. He said, then it was a great day. He said, your worst day sober is better than your best day when you were drinking. I said, that's not even true. That, that's not even true. My, my best day, you know, when I was out sending and having a good time, I had a good time. And, and I'm not saying that that's good. I'm just telling you it's the truth. I was having a good time. It was a destructive pathway that didn't have long to last, but it was fun. And I think what, what Jesus is trying to say, Paul is trying to say to us people, and Paul probably do it better than you want to, you want to, on a scale of one to ten, you're looking for a sinner, Paul's a ten. And when, when Jesus was trying to tell us all the time, don't worry so much about what you've done or about where you've been, start concentrating on where you're going. That looking in the rearview mirror thing is, is uh, you know why in the car the windshield's really big and the, wind, the rearview mirror's a little small? You're supposed to spend more time, more time looking forward than you yeah. do back. Amen. And if you ride a motorcycle, let me just tell you, they got little bitty rearview mirrors. You need to see what's behind you, but don't be looking back because you're going to go where you look. And I think that's absolutely true in life as well. My problem is with, with humanity today is we tend to be looking 5 or 10 or 15 years down the road and not an hour from now or two hours from now. 
I think we ongoingly miss opportunities to help people to be the body of Christ because we're too busy worrying about what are they going to think about me or what will somebody think? What if I stop with that lady at Walmart who's crying and pray with her in the aisle? Somebody might think I'm a Jesus freak. Now, if we really had talented worship people, they would go into right now, DC Talks, what would people think if they knew I was a Jesus freak, right? Yeah, too bad we don't have that. <laughs> but, 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 you know, what would people say if they knew you were a Jesus freak? And why don't they know? That's the question. What are we so afraid to tell somebody that we believe in the Savior? We believe that Jesus is the one way to eternal life. And if they don't believe it yet, I, when I was a sales guy, we always said, if you, if you haven't got a yes, you just haven't found the reasons yet to say yes. You know? I mean, if you're saying no to what I'm offering to you, it, that's okay. I've just got to find a new way to talk to you about it, a new way to show you that what it is. Look, friends, everybody on this planet needs Jesus Christ. That's right. They need Jesus worse than they need an election or politics or any of the other stuff that goes around they need it because sometime we may come in contact with the COVID virus or we may have a wreck on the side of the road. Jesus is there for all of those. There's nobody else that is. One of the saddest things is when people die, they call the pastor to be a part of planning the funeral and, and the people that are planning the funeral say, well, do you think dad was saved? To me, that's extremely sad that nobody would know. Yeah. I remember doing a, a neighbor, a uh, friend of mine, our neighbor across the street died, and his family asked me to, well, they, did, they told me he was in the hospital, and I went up and I prayed with him, and we prayed together. But he didn't tell them, and they didn't know, and, and when we got to planning the service, they said, we're worried about Dad. I said, you don't need to worry, Dad's fine. But well, we tend to keep things so close to our best, we don't want to share. It, it, when I grew up in the Methodist Church, the membership vows were... Uh, I pledge to join this church with my presence, prayers, presence, gifts, and service. No wonder we were on decline for like 50 years. We forgot to witness. We forgot. Witness was only added like in 1993 or something like that. It's not that long ago. And so, you know, let me tell you, that's as important as any of the others. If you go eat at a great new restaurant, do you tell people about it? If you go eat at a real crummy, bad restaurant, do you tell people about it? Absolutely. You know, if Jesus does something for your life, why are we talking about it? Why aren't we witnessing and sharing our faith? And we can do it wherever we are. We can do it whether we're out, you know, selling shoes or uh, pancakes, whatever it is that we're, we're selling that day. Uh, or Panera Bread or, uh, I don't know, <laughs> whatever, school, math, math lessons, you know. But we can do it with the spirit of love and care, and we can care about people even when they don't know why we care about them. I had to, well, for me it was a privilege. I don't know that it was for Kathy, but an old movie that, um, gosh, I remember seeing it at the movie theater about the, the adventures of Huckleberry Finn. It was made before some of y'all were born. It was in color, though. And, uh, and, and one of the things about Huck is it didn't matter what kind of situation he got into. He tried to work his way through it. You know, you know the story about Huck when he's told to go paint the fence, right? Or maybe that was Tom Sawyer, actually, I think. That he painted the fence. And so somebody said, well, what are you doing? He said, I'm painting this fence because it's fun. And pretty soon he's got three or four people painting and he's not painting anymore. It's kind of that way with our faith. You know, I was talking to someone today and said, well, you know, I invite people to church and sometimes they come. Well, you know, maybe they won't come here. Maybe they'll go somewhere. <laughs> maybe they, they just need to be invited. I know back when I worked in, in psychiatric hospitals, people needed to hear the truth. Sometimes they needed to hear, friend, you've got a drug problem. Friend, you've got an alcohol problem. They usually did not like me when I told them that. But you know what? Somebody had to be the first one to tell them. And I want to tell you, friends, if we're going to do this witnessing, I'm not talking about let's get together and walk down the street uh, offering people tracts from the Bible. It's when somebody says, how did you get through that difficult time in your life, that time when you got laid off or unemployment happened or somebody in your family died, and you tell them, because Jesus got me through. And if you don't know him, let me take you to a place where you can be introduced to our Lord and Savior. 
it's not about us, it's about God. God's wanting to do the work, but we've got to do the, the entry work. We've got to do the introduction. We've got to be a reason. So I think it's not a secret why church decline before COVID-19 was, was prevalent in almost every church. It's not a secret. Because the church wasn't doing anything for people. And I think maybe COVID-19 is causing us to reinvent the church. Now, it's been reinvented a few times since Jesus went back to heaven. There's no harm in that. But maybe we need to realize that some of the time we were being pretty puffed up. I, I recall a friend of mine, when we started Saturday Night Worship here, he said, man, that might be a good idea. He said, I think I'll interview my church people and see when they would like to have church. Well, he did. He inter did the interview on Sunday morning, and guess when most of them said they wanted to come? <laughs> Sunday morning. He didn't interview the people that weren't there on Sunday morning. And you know, in a shift work town like this one, if you're working those 10-hour shifts, uh, there's people that, that if they're on the wrong rotation, they won't be here for six weeks or eight weeks. So maybe we should have church on a different day. Maybe we should have it at a different time. Maybe that's one of the blessings we've gotten out of putting these things on the internet is that I know, because I can read the stats on it, there are people watching it at midnight or three in the morning or five in the morning. We've got one church member that works midnights, and I know she watches it regularly, but never at the time we put it online. We're not here for us. We're here for them, whoever them is. And it is sometimes funny to think about food. It's a little disconcerting to hear the part on here that food doesn't bring you closer to God because when we have food events at the church, we get more people. I'm not sure what the correlation there is. Uh, we are sometimes known as knife and fork Methodists because we eat at everything. My mother used to laugh. She was a Baptist growing up. Uh, you know, English peas are something that she never ate in her whole life because she went to a Methodist dinner. And we serve them at every one, it seems like. But hear this just one more time so we can reflect on it. Concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. So when we look at tradition, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience, be careful that we don't weigh one heavier than the other. Because some people get into reading the scripture because they have an experience. Some people read the scripture and it causes an experience. Sometimes it's the tradition of just doing what we do in church that leads people to care about God. And sometimes people realize the mess they're in. They're like that guy walking me, walking into my first meeting in the rooms of AA when I realized I was broken and I needed help. And I suspect that more of us in the church need help than we want to admit. And we need to help shore people up, lift up, build up. Paul says, whatever we do, let's build people up. Let's don't tear them down. And I'm just so worried that the church becomes a place where we tell somebody, I, I drive past signs every week that say things on their, on their church sign, you know, like turn or burn or, or uh, you know, God's here or whatever. God is everywhere. That's right. The question is, are we showing God through ourselves? Are we being a reflection Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by Him. As far as the eating of food to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and from whom we exist and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. It's not everyone, however, that has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. I, uh, there's some things I can't do in my life because I don't want to be in danger of tearing anybody down. I wear a helmet when I ride my motorcycle. 
because I don't want to set a bad example for the kids that I see and know and watch me. I probably would really enjoy going to the dog races, not to bet because I like to watch them, but if I were seen there, what would somebody say? Mm -hmm. Years ago, I parked my car in front of a liquor store. Unbeknownst to me, I haven't been in a liquor store in 31 years. But I parked there going to a restaurant and one of the church members called me in just a little while to see if I was okay. <coughs> You know, I appreciate that, even though it was a little bit nosy, but I still appreciate that because the way I stay sober, the way I live my life is to realize that I am an example for other people, not just because I'm a pastor, because I've been baptized as a Christian and you have that same example, right? And so we are the example that may lead that other person, that other person to find his way in Christ. Anybody that loves God is known by God. Anybody that loves Jesus Christ is known by Him. And if He knows us, He's already told us, I go and prepare a place for you. I will not leave you orphaned. He says, in a little while I'll leave. You'll no longer see me, but I'll be there. And I'll be with you in another place, lo, through the ages or the ends of the earth. Friends, this is a special time. It's a time when there are people out there that have time to listen. They have time to, to watch. You don't even have to invite them to church. Just tell them how to find the website. And see what goes on here. See the people that are here. The kind of folk it is. They can look at us and tell we're a motley crew. And that's okay. I'm glad of that. It's an imperfect church. Pastored by an imperfect pastor. Doing the work of a perfect Savior. Amen. Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the opportunity we have to worship, to be with you, and now to receive the sacrament. We ask you to be with us now as we put forth the elements of the sacrament for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So friends, we have, uh, we have adapted our communion for COVID. Some of you have been here before. Uh, JT will bless the elements here in just a second, and then we will uh, serve you a little cup that has the bread in it, a little cup that has the grape juice in it, and you're invited to come. As In just a minute, you'll be invited to come, and we will celebrate the sacrament together. Go ahead. Lift up your hearts and give thanks to God. Blessed are you, O God, who, with your word and Holy Spirit, created all things and called them good. In Jesus Christ, your word became flesh and dwelt among us. Through Jesus' suffering and death, you took upon yourself our sin and death and destroyed their power forever. You raised from the dead the same Jesus who now reigns with you in glory and poured upon us your Holy Spirit, making us the people of your new covenant. On the night before meeting with death, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken or which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to the disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts that in the breaking of this bread and the drinking of this wine, we may know the presence of the living Christ and be renewed as the body of Christ for the world and redeemed by Christ's blood until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at your table forever. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. So, so friends, we have a, a bucket up here. We, our offering basket is in the back. Of course, we gladly accept your gift signs and offerings there. We have a missionary in Brazil. Her name is Emily Everett. If you have some spare change, nickel stocks or quarters, uh, dollars, hundreds, whatever, uh, we'll be glad they accept those in the bucket for her as we send those to her to do her work, the work we're not able to do in Brazil. If you're in the praise team and you're going to play, come play.
Friends, the table, the table is prepared. Come to this place for heaven and earth.